In this segment, Dr. Carl G. Stonecipher of Greensboro, North Carolina, talks about the treatment of patients with high myopia with astigmatism. He discusses current treatment options and outcomes working on the cornea versus the lens. He also walks us through the decision-making process and shares his approach to patient education. One of the things that, that we're finding out more and more today is we're faced with choices in higher myopic patients. So higher myopic patients with astigmatism, we now have options of working on the cornea or working on the lens. We can go as far to say as working on the lens as far as cataract surgery goes, but when we go into cataract surgery on a highly myopic patient with a long axial length in a young patient, we have a lot of other factors to consider in terms of retinal detachment and some of the complications related to a younger patient with an intact vitreous base. So when we look at these young patients, we still kind of finalize them to either LASIK or intraocular contact lenses, and that's the, the choices we have today. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to look at all the parameters with regard to the patient, both preoperatively and the number one thing and number one issue we're looking at now is how thick the patient's cornea is. And can we get away with doing certain types of treatment? Well, we could go back to conventional treatments, which my problem with conventional treatments are they take off less tissue, but the problem with conventional treatments is we're more likely to get problems with glare, halos, those kind of problems. With a custom treatment, we take off too much tissue in many instances, and sometimes you can adjust that, uh, but we would rather find something in the sweet spot or in the middle, and what I found is the Wavefront Optimized platform is the best option to reduce potential problems, but at the same time get the patient's outcomes that we want. Primarily, when you look at if you're going to do a corneal procedure or a lens procedure on a patient, age definitely does matter. And, and my cutoff is around 45, because at 45 years of age, what comes into play? Presbyopia. So at that level, if you're working on the cornea and there's successful monovision contact lens wear, you don't have a problem. If you're working inside the eye and you're putting a lens in, you may not be giving them what they think they're getting, and that's intermediate and near as well. Now, a lot of these higher myopes and higher myopic astigmats are happy because they can see the world where they couldn't before without their big thick glasses or their contact lenses. So I think that's important too. There's a risk reward. But at about 45, which is the FDA cutoff, uh, which I pretty much follow those guidelines, the lens is not approved. So it'd be an off-label uh, usage of the lens above that age. And at that level, I start talking to them about lens-related procedures as long as the anatomy of the eye is not a potential problem. Now, on the other hand, if we look at the star intraocular lens, or star intraocular contact lens, basically what we're seeing is we can get great outcomes. And, and I've said this before, but primarily what you want is to bring the lens as close to the nodal point of the eye as you can, and basically I think you get better outcomes that way, better quality of vision, better issues. But at the same time, uh, cost comes into play because Putting in an intraocular contact lens, you have the issues of taking them into the opera suite. You have the, the issues of buying a, the intraocular contact lens and, and a lot of other cost issues associated with it. And there are certain patients that say, you know, Doc, if I had a normal cornea and you felt like I could do LASIK, I feel more comfortable because one of my family members had it or my significant other had that or, or whatever. Now, just like with LASIK, we have to look at nomogram development in these patients and we have to look at the need for retreatments or enhancements. And just like with LASIK, I like to look at the post-op uncorrected vision versus the post-op, I'm sorry, pre-op best corrected vision. So what I want to be able to tell a patient is if I look at them before surgery and they're 20-20, what's the likelihood of them being 20-20 without glasses post-operatively? And in these patients, in this study, we're looking at that 9 out of 10, we could actually say got equal to or better than their best corrected vision preoperatively, which is, is in this number, we're talking about treating the minus 10s, 11, 12s, as high as minus 16 and 17s of the world. Uh, that's important. And that we can also say that a third of them got better vision, or they actually gained vision over what they saw in their glasses or contact lenses before. So we looked at a data series that ranged from minus 8 and a quarter to minus 9, 1975. 
And we showed that, yes, in the intraocular contact lens with appropriate nomogram development, we can get good post-operative outcomes, and the average sphere was plus 0 0.06, plus or minus 0.39. So we're, we're, we're doing well with our nomograms and doing well with our outcomes. And what is the average pre-op best corrective visual acuity versus the average post-op uncorrected visual acuity? And I think this is very important in that patients actually got better. They went from 0 0.705 plus or minus 0.17, which is roughly around 20, 25 to 20, 30s vision, all the way up on average, their post-op uncorrected visual acuity was right at the one level, uh, which was uh, equivalent to about 20, 20 in, in, in most of the patients. And that's important. Now, that's good, but, but what about the laser? And I talked earlier about, uh, I think, wavefront optimized is, is the way to go in these patients because we can do adjustments with the optical zones, whether we do a 6.5 versus a 6 millimeter optical zone, still get large optical zone sizes that are true refractive change treatments, so we get larger optical zones that are more uh, uh, likely to not have associated glare, halos, or starbursts. And this laser, in fact, is approved up to minus 14 with up to six diopters of, of cylinder in the myopic range, and in the hyperopic range, uh, up to six diopters of hyperopia with up to six diopters of cylinder as well. Now, if we look at the wave light laser from, from zero to minus six diopters with up to three diopters of cylinder, all comers uh, and all targets, we're getting around 98%, 20, 20, are better, which, which is good. If we bump that up to the plano targets, people that we didn't try and uh, leave a little nearsighted because they were a little bit older and maybe that'll allow them to read uh, like a modified monovision. Uh, we're running that number around 99%, which is pretty close to what my enhancement rate on this laser platform is, which is about 0.88%. So pretty close to 1% to of the patients are coming back for a touch-up. If we looked at the R-squared values associated with that, we can get good attempted versus achieved up to minus 10 with up to 3.5 diopters of cylinder, but what if we take that up even higher? We can, and we can get good outcomes, we can get good visions, but what we're more likely to get in that patient population is a higher enhancement rate. So again, going back to looking at this patient population, you've got to make sure that you have enough room on the cornea, both for the initial procedure and the secondary procedure, and you have to tell that patient that's a real likelihood uh, when you're talking about treating the minus 10s to minus 12s of the world. But with that, just like with the star intraocular contact lens, we're seeing patients that are actually gaining vision in about one out of three patients. So patients' best corrected vision is better postoperatively, and their uncorrected vision is better postoperatively, uh, either on the laser or on the lens platform. And again, with appropriate nomogram development, you can get R-squareds, and my sphere R-squared is almost one. It's 0.997, with one being perfect. And astigmatism, you get more effects of coupling as you get higher up, because why? because it's taken longer to treat these patients. So I think things like uh, temperature, humidity, uh, environmental factors in the room play uh, a, a portion of this because as you lay the flat back, there's more exposure because you're treating the patient for a longer period of time. The femtosecond laser uh, has changed the level of myopia we're treating definitely. The unpredictability of depth with, with various micro, uh, or meta, say that, the unpredictability of the microkeratome led us to have larger standard deviations. Now with the femtosecond laser, I've got standard deviations in the 10 micron or less range. So I can know that if I've got a 100 micron flap, I'm not going to get a 150 micron surprise. I may get 110 or I may get 90. So my point is, is we're much tighter on our standard deviations with the, the femtosecond laser. And I think the femtosecond laser has allowed us to treat a lot of patients that, that we couldn't treat before. Dr. Stonecipher talks about anatomical considerations when selecting a surgical approach. You know, when we look at patient's anatomy, um, we obviously are now with the new paper uh, by Randleman et al. And, and some of the other corneal ectasia articles that we've seen, we've seen that the PRK rate has slowly risen. Um, and more and more people are doing PRK on those patients with uh, anomalous uh, computed topography or asymmetrical computed topography or however you want to look at that. So I think that, you know, I may lean more towards a intraocular contact lens on those patients 
in the higher myopic range because those are the patients that we're now able with our computed topography uh, and a lot of the other analysis that we're doing, able to look at those patients and say, you know, that's probably someone we shouldn't be doing a corneal procedure on. Uh, it would be nice or will be nice when we ultimately get the star intraocular contact lens available uh, to come in and treat us uh, or, or be able to, you know, treat those patients with the star lens. Now, the, the one thing that I think about laser platforms is I like the Wavelight laser for this reason is because I can get a true effective optical zone. I can take off less tissue than I can with customized procedures uh, and I'm not getting the outcomes that I saw before in years past with glare, halo, starburst, and the wavefront optimizers allowed us to bring a few more patients in. But when you have that irregular cornea, you always have to think, okay, is this somebody that could potentially be a corneal ectasia down the line? When I look at a patient that has a, what I would consider a normal cornea, which I think we can sometimes define that, uh, I think that, that those patients, I tend to try and work on the cornea if I can. If they have any outliers, that's when I start thinking about working inside the lens, or inside the eye, excuse me. And primarily, the reason that is is because we don't really truly know yet. We're looking at it. Bill Trattler's done a lot of work on this area. Randleman's done a lot of work on this area. Stolting's done a lot of work on this area. The ASCRS has done a lot of work on this area. Of why do people get ectatic? Do they have bad genes? Uh, was the flap too thick, like with a microkeratome versus a femtosecond laser? Um, was the cornea uh, anomalous? Uh, you know, is the cornea more malleable? Uh, and, and that is why they're getting ectasia. So I think that, that we try and look at all the information and then try and weight average what we want to do. But I'm not sure we have the answer for corneal lactasia. We know a lot more than we did 10 years ago, but I'm not quite sure we know which patient uh, in every case will not develop lactasia and which one will. Like any surgeon, Dr. Stonecipher's goal is to keep the enhancement rate low no matter what surgical approach he takes. He talks about guiding the patient through the decision-making process. When a, a higher myopic individual comes in, you think of it really simple. You think it's either going to be a corneal procedure or it's going to be inside the eye procedure. And that's the way I like to present it to the patient. So we're going to either work on your cornea or we're going to work inside your eye. If you work on the cornea, I look at them and say you have to have the appropriate anatomy to be able to do that. If you're talking about doing a lens procedure, you have to have the appropriate anatomy to do that as well. And all those patients that I'm working inside the eye, I'll definitely have them go see a retina specialist. So there's a lot of different issues that we look at, an extraocular procedure versus an intraocular procedure, but that's the way I like to draw the line to the patient because it makes it simpler. And then I can look at the patient and say, okay, if we do an extraocular procedure like LASIK on your cornea, this is what the cost is. But now if we have to go inside the eye, now you know that's going to involve anesthesia, that's going to involve paying for the lens, that's going to involve going to the surgery center. There's a lot more uh, involved in terms of the actual procedure itself. So that's going to add cost to the overall price. And, and those patients tend to seem to get that. And then the way I, I try to tell them is if you're one of my family members, if you're my mother and my father and my brother and my sister, this is what I would choose in you and this is why I'd choose it. It makes it a much easier, more palatable for the patient to choose.